Wow. I want to talk about the cost of the anointing. And this is going to be the last, uh, the last uh, conversation of the afternoon. The cost of the anointing. We want to talk about the fact that, you know, the anointing cost. We mentioned this earlier. And what is the cost? How, what are some of the things that are going to have to happen for you to receive this anointing? Like I said, this first day is just giving some foundation for some of the things that we're trusting God for as we move into the next season. How many people are blessed already? Anybody who's blessed? All right. How many, who has learned something they didn't know? Yeah, something that, yeah, there was something that came that maybe was new. We bless God for that. I really believe that God, like I said, there's not just revelation in the house, but there's impartation in the house. You're going to teach this, by the way, to your sons and daughters. Amen. I said you're going to teach this to your sons and daughters. Yeah. It's very different when you're listening, knowing you will teach it, by the way, as opposed to just listening for, for, for learning it for yourself. You will teach it. And some of you don't think you're teachers. I'm just saying right now, the impartation of this house is upon you. Yeah. Uh, upenda usipenda, you will be a teacher. You cannot be in this house and just move through life. You have to be a fearless influencer. Amen. Amen. I want to talk about the, the cost of the anointing. Matthew 13, verse 44 to 46 is what I want to start with. And it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Does that sound familiar? Anybody heard of hidden treasure somewhere? Aha. Uh -huh. So the kingdom of heaven, this is how it operates. Um, you're about to learn something about hidden treasures. It's like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. Oh. Wow. He found it and he hid it. Why would he do such a thing? He says, and then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought the field. Somebody say, ah. That's why he did it. The man went and everything he had ever had. Now, you'd think that selling something, everything that you own, all the things that are precious to you. I'm sure he sold his, there were some things there that were like his sister, his, ka, ka, ah, ah, Pastor Bonnie, you're here. Yeah. You're distracting me. Let me just appreciate Pastor Bonnie from Harvest Family Church. Start, stand and wave to people. This is a great man of God. radio system from campus days the one that you really like what are the things you like you remember all the things you like your wife <laughs> all things that you've been takes your nice car huh who likes their car Because the one, the one they like, they don't have yet. <laughs> you like your car. <laughs> that plot of land that you bought and you've been planning to build your dream house on it. Whatever it is, all those things, you know, everything of yours that is good. He had no second thought. In fact, the Bible told us what was his attitude when he sold those things. Joy. Joy. In his joy. He's like, ah. How much do you want? Half. Chukua. And guys are like, are you crazy? And he's like, just take it, take it, take it. He's happy. You know when I talk about the cost of them, some of you are thinking, Aish, pain. Jesus says, unless you're my disciple, you, you have to sell it. And you're like, oh God. <laughs> Painful. Sad. Ah, ah, ah. Joy. Joy. Why was he joyful? Tell me why was he joyful? He knew what, he was. He knew what was in that field. In fact, he knew that these things are nothing compared to what he's about to receive. Whenever Jesus asks you to pay a cost, it's not a painful cost. Because what you receive is always ten times 
a hundred times what you will give up. Yeah, he says it himself in his times as more and also eternal life. So it's a joyful thing that this man does. He sells it all to receive this thing. Let me tell you that anointing is the greatest treasure you'll ever receive. There's nothing like it. You will sell everything you have and you will still feel you got the best deal. People will be looking at you like, are you crazy? You sold this and you'll be like, ha, you don't even know. You have no idea. The thing that I have received, you will not be, I wish you could only know what, you, what I've received for what I've sold. People look at you and, and you'll be like, I, I wish they could even tell. The thing that I've received. You see, the thing of the kingdom of heaven, it's like many treasures, it's hidden in plain sight. It's there. But for many Christians, they don't see it because it's hidden. It's not obvious. It's like treasure hidden. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And I believe, like I said earlier, it's hidden to keep away casual observers. The browsers. The people who just come to receive some inspiration. It's hidden from them. And let me tell you, you can come for a gathering, you can even go for 12 gatherings and receive nothing. Wow. Yeah. Because of your attitude. Because of how you've come. Because of what you're ready to receive. And this aware. He's looking and he finds it. You know, I told you the disciples, many, many, many times they asked Jesus, why don't you just tell people plainly? Just tell them what you want to say. But Jesus says, uh-uh. The things of heaven are hidden from such a So that verse, Matthew 13, just put verse 13, Matthew 13. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like, an, okay, let's go to Matthew 13, 11. 13, 11. It was the same story. Matthew 13, 11. Are you there? You there without no root. All right. He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you and not to them. Yeah? He says, whoever has, go to verse 12, because it says a bit more. <laughs> You know, there's something I learned from Bishop Bonnie's church, Pastor Bonnie's church. This guy's a bishop, by the way. They have a water gun. The person at the, at the slides, I'm talking to you. They have a water gun. Did you bring your water gun? <laughs> it says, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. That's a very sobering thing, Christians. Because it's saying there are some Christians who already have received and they're going to receive more. Yes. And it's saying there are some who have not received and they will even the little they have will be taken away from them. This is how the kingdom of heaven works. And this is Jesus himself saying. If it was somebody else, we'd have said, ah, people are just harsh. Jesus is love. I put it to you, you don't know Jesus. He says those who are already hungry to learn will learn more. Those who are hungry to receive will receive more. Those who are ready to receive the impartation will receive it. Those who are not serious about the treasures will not access it. When something is hidden, it means you must take the work to find it. Come on. Isn't it? I mean, this guy, he must have had to walk through the field in the first place. Maybe there was a, a, a fence because it was not his field. So he has to have the ability and the willingness to climb over that fence. Maybe he is walking through that fence and he's prospecting for something. Maybe there are snakes. Maybe they, it's not cultivated. Maybe it's just a rough place to go. Maybe there are dogs he's aware that could chase him any time. Whatever it is, this man is looking for something and he's willing to take the risk to find it. And when he finds it, it's because he took the effort. Listen, lazy people will never receive anointing. If you're not willing to take the effort to actually receive it, you will never receive it. There's a price to pay to get the anointing. And Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Wow. Very powerful word. Very powerful word. Matthew 20, verse 22. These disciples come and ask Jesus, we want to sit next to you. We want to be at your right hand, at your left hand. We want the anointing of prime minister. The ones next to you. And Jesus, what does Jesus tell them? He tells them, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? And of course, they said, yes, we can. <laughs> I sure Jesus just checked and he said, okay, sour. <laughs> and they did, by the way. They did. The first one was killed right after Pentecost. He was 
to by Herod. He was, he was, his, his head was cut off with a sword. That was James. So they, they actually drank the cup. They, they paid for this anointing with their lives. So Jesus must have been like, guys, do you know that this thing costs? What are you asking for? But listen, remember what I said. The word of the attitude for searching is what? It's joy. Have you ever found something that is worth giving your life for joyfully? Uh -uh. I'm talking to people who have no idea what I'm talking about. I think it's a lunch. Yeah. Let me try again. Ha Do you know there are things that are worth giving your life for joyfully? Yeah. You know that for Peter, when they told him they were going to kill him, they said, we're going to crucify you like your master. <laughs> you know what he told them? He told them, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. That is even too much. Crucify me upside down. I can't handle what you can't put me like Jesus. People will confuse me for Jesus. So they crucified him upside down. <laughs> Remember, these are the ones who are beaten and they left there rejoicing, saying, We've been counted worthy. The things in your life that you receive and perceive, and then on, there is nothing that can take them away from you. There is no fear you'll ever have. You can kill me if you want because what I have, you didn't give to me and you can't take away. Wow. Yeah. Okay, some of you are looking at me like you have no idea. I'm talking French. <laughs> but there are things like those. The disciples all are willing to give up their lives because of this power of the Holy Spirit. Because they found something greater than life itself. Wow. The book of Revelation tells us that that anointing carried them to become the pillars of the heavenly Jerusalem. That there are 12 gates named after each one of them. Yeah. They understood that their, their destiny was way bigger than even this earth could contain. The treasure they received. You need to understand that there's joy when you pay the cost of anointing. I don't want you to hear cost and just hear pain. I want you to understand that without pain, there's no gain. If you're playing sports, you, must, you understand there's a pain of winning. There's a pain of practice, isn't it? Hey, guys. Are there sports people in this church? Uh, we should, I think we should abolish lunch. There's a young man here who's saying, I, you guys, when you fast, you're so alert. <laughs> hey! We need to fast tomorrow. <laughs> it's a cooler. I think it's getting in the way of the anointing. Yeah, when, when you're fast, I mean, when you're working out, by the way, if you ever see a person with a six pack, <laughs> huh? It's just that I don't want to open here. But you see a girl with a six pack. <laughs> yes, sir. There is pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is pain. You work hard to get it, isn't it? Yeah, there's pain for it. But uh, she can tell you there's something there. Maybe not six, maybe about five and a half. It's, it's there. <laughs> so just understand, people, that there is a cost. Tell your neighbor there's a cost. But on the other side of the cost is joy. There's joy, there's joy.
Thank you. Time is one of the most precious components, precious, uh, precious valuables in this world. And without being willing to trade your time, you will never receive anointing. You know, many people spend hours watching TV, browsing the internet, sleeping even, but they struggle to find time to come for a gathering, to go for, for their family night meeting, to go for their discipleship group. They struggle, they are busy, but they have time for many other things. They have time on TikTok and doing all the other things. Tick I said what, TikTok. <laughs> it's the anointing, by the way, it's just happening. There's one of you who's about to invent TikTok right now. Just that's how anointing is received, by the way. You don't just laugh, you receive. <laughs> yeah. Anointing is caught, it's transmitted, it's not taught. So you have to make time to receive it. You have to make time to be in the presence of the person you're receiving it from. You have to make time to listen. Maybe you're listening to music on your, on, on your way to work. You should take time to listen to your message. Receive the anointing, receive the blessing. It will cost you time. Wow. You know, I love that Jesus' disciples love to tarry. Mm. Whenever the crowd dispersed, there are always some people asking questions. So what did you mean when you said this? How does this thing apply to our lives? And Jesus always had something to pour that everybody else missed. Yeah. Learn to tarry. Learn to tarry. You know, the first time I went to Bishop Jimmy's church, his, his uh, Harvest Family Church, is a church that his pastor is from. I think that day it was... I think we're in shock. What a shock. I think we, I wasn't even the one preaching. I took the preacher. It was up more. And then afterwards, I said a prayer for the church. And then they took us in to a place for, for dinner. Uh, this service was ending at about 9. So this was Sunday. And the service started in the evening at about 7. Went till around 9-ish, 9.30. So we went for dinner. And I remember we went and ate and had a really good time. I think we must have taken like about an hour, an hour and a half. So we're coming out at about 11. And we come out at 11, half the church was in the parking lot. 11, on a Sunday night. And I'm thinking, these guys are crazy. What are they doing? And they all came forward when they saw their pastor. And they said, we just want a final word and a blessing. And Pastor Jimmy said, Pastor M, do you have a blessing for these people? And at that point, God gave me a word for them. And I spoke that word. And then he said, Apmo, do you have a, a blessing for my people? And Apmo, God, I re received a prophetic word and he gave it. And then their pastor prayed for them. Because they stayed, they received. Wow. Because they stayed, they received. Meanwhile, there are people who went. Yeah. If you don't understand the power of blessing, then you won't understand the, the reason for tarrying. Wow. Yeah. There's something in those spoken words that changes destinies. Something is transmitted. People who understand anointing understand the use that they trade their time to receive something in return. And I, 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 one of the things I, that's always interesting for me is after family night, you guys see us at family night. We finish at 6.30. We've typically already had our time together with, the, with, with, with my group. But usually, <laughs> I chase them from the house from around 9 o'clock. There are times they've left almost closer to 11.00. And that's a day we've probably been together since nine in the morning. And you know the best, sweetest times are after. The aftermath. When we've finished everything and we're now relaxed and there's no agenda. We have what we call non-agenderized conversations. Non-agenderized. We can talk about anything. Somebody just says something random and something powerful happens in that moment. And we just pour in. It's just a place to lean in and just to pour. And let me tell you something. You're missing out if you don't understand that time is your resource and you trade it for something better. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. You receive something you wouldn't have received in your sleep. Wow. Yeah. Time is your resource. It's your resource. Yeah. It's a gift God has given you to trade to receive something better in return. Oh, yes. So this is something you need to be willing to do. I think uh, one of the things that Pastor Vic told me is in, in, in South, I don't know if you guys still do it, but after service, People hear the word, and then after service, they have snacks, and everybody just relaxes. Yeah. And that you guys sometimes even leave church at four. Yeah. Eight. Wow. Four o'clock. Yeah. Is that a real Bavuno church? Yeah. Four. four. As in they've been there since they finished their service at 12. 
And then all the time, they're just standing there talking, hanging out, relaxing, receiving. It's called the power of time. Yeah. Are you willing to pay your time? You know, it's so weird. The way we are in, as Kenyans is we're, especially Kenyans, I know the other nation, nationalities here, but Kenyans, we're weird. Because Kenyans, I think we think that we have to be running to show that we are busy. Yeah, yeah. By running. It's like, we're, we're like, you know, it's like, where are you going? <laughs> I remember when, the first time I went to, this, true story, when I went to Uganda the first time, we're in a van, we're going to some church planters, I mean, I, was, I mean, we're going to plant Mavuno Kampala, and we came out of the van, it was in the middle of town, and there was a guy who was taking me to change money. And I remember just coming out, and I'm like, okay, guys, I'll see you in a few minutes, I'll be back. And the Ugandan driver is with me. And I'm like, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. And at some point, the guy said, Pastor, relax. Where are we running to? <laughs> I said, oh, we're going to the ATM. He said, look around. Is anybody else running? <laughs> then, then we saw another guy running. He said, that's a Kenyan right there. <laughs> And that's the day it struck me. We run when we are going nowhere. Like, it's just, we just have to show we are busy. We are, we are using our time well. You're just moving. So when you're talking with your guys, like, hey, how, what's up, what's up, how are you doing? How's the family, Nini? Then you say, all right, sasa. Sa, 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 eh? Cheers, eh? Let's go, let's go. Where are you going? Nobody knows where you're going. Even you don't know where you're going. But you have to go. Quickly. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not talking about the people on this side, huh? <laughs> it's these ones. <laughs> Guys, tell your neighbor, relax. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, you're going to miss out on life running, going nowhere you miss out on the most important conversations. Yes. One word at the right sp time spoken could change your life. Yes. Just the right word. All the things you are running to do, that word could be given there and it solved your problem. That business meeting you're having tomorrow, yes. that problem in your business, yes. one word could change everything. Yes. Just by you being in the right place at the right time. So this thing about running, going nowhere, Relax. I, I know that, uh, I don't know if Pastor Nyamu is in the house. Is she around? She's not here. Oh, she has a wedding. Okay. But Pastor Nyamu, she tells me that every Sunday after lunch, they go to her house with her leaders. I don't know if they still do that. But they just go and have non agendaized conversations. Just go and sit and relax. Sorry, you need to adjust your mic. So, I think what I'm trying to say is, that time you have, that asset you have, use it. <laughs> what has he done? <laughs> Is he playing with the anointing? <laughs> use your time well. Tell your neighbor, use your time well. It's the only thing that God has given you that is such a valuable asset. It's, your time is more valuable than money, by the way. Yeah. When Alexander the Great died, he wanted to be buried, not in a coffin. He wanted to be buried with his hands hanging like this. So everybody who watched him on the procession could see his hands. And when they asked him, why do you want that? He said, I want people to understand. You brought nothing into the world. You will take nothing out of the world. The only thing you have is the time that was given to you. It's the only thing you have. Yeah. So where are you running to? Stay and receive the anointing. Stay and receive the impartation. Stay and hang out. By the way, when you hang out with people, with your, with your pastors, you will learn so many things. You will pick up so many ideas. There are things that you will receive that you will not have received in the sermon. Yeah. It's such a valuable... I know, Pastor Grace, you take, you take people home nowadays and you cook for them. Come on, Pastor Grace. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I was just testing. You know, she tells me she does. I wanted to see if her church will clap. <laughs> and they have clapped because they have eaten your food, isn't it? Amen. Her stories are true. Number two, the cost of the anointing, humility. 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 
You know, we love to feel important. But I've come to understand that anointing requires humility to accept that you don't know. The humility to understand that I have, there's something I don't have that someone else had. But then let me just say this. It's such a humbling thing to realize you don't have everything you need. If you had it, right now you'd be preaching across the world with thousands of followers. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, are you preaching around the world with, a thousand with thousands of followers? Yeah. No, no, I'm just, I'm just trying. By the way, I'm, not, I'm just being hum humbly honest. It's just the truth, isn't it? There are still things you don't have. Because if you had everything you needed, you'd already be so effective. And humility is understanding that. Just understand, I don't have it. I need help. Why is your DG not growing? There are five at the beginning of the year, there are still five. But in fact, now there are three. And they're on WhatsApp. But when the pastor is preaching, you're, you're like, uh, when is he finishing? We go. Huh? And you show up for the meeting late. Huh? The pastor didn't even quote some verses. In fact, you even can quote the verses for the pastor. I even know this passage better than him. So why is it, ask your neighbor, is it growing? Your DG? Yeah. And again, I'm saying this in humility because really it's to tell your neighbor, you don't know everything. There's some things you don't know that you need to learn. Yeah. Humility. It's interesting because humility is understanding that someone else has grace or impartation that I need in my life. Because we've been taught to be self-made people. We want to be the ones who received it. I had the vision. I did it. That's how we feel that it's supposed to be. It feels humbling to sit myself under someone's feet to learn or receive from them. What about if that person is younger than me? Hey. What if they are less educated than me? By the way, some of you, your DG leader is younger than you. Yes. He's single, in fact. And in fact, he's single. Yeah. It's true. And then he's the one who God has given the impartation to pray for your marriage. And the reason your marriage is not progressing is because you're not receiving from somebody who has something God has put in for you. Because you're saying, what do they even know about marriage? Me, I want to be prayed for by Bishop. Bishop of marriage. <laughs> you need to be willing to humble yourself in order to receive. You cannot receive if you don't humble yourself. Papa pa Kilo, just come. Bring, give me this. Give me, give me this. Uh, give me this. Give me the balls. Yeah. So Papa Kilo has an empty bowl. And there's something that God has poured into my life. Amen. There's something God has poured in my life for him, by the way. No, this is not an illustration. It's the truth. There's something that God has put in my life that is for him. And for his wife, Faith. Faith, you know that, isn't it? Yeah, his, his wife knows that. I don't know if he knows, but his wife knows. <laughs> now, for me to pour this, something has to happen. Because I want to pour. But you can see, what, what, what's happening? Is it possible for me to pour his anointing into his life? Something has to change in this equation, isn't it? Right now, he's, he's, he's in a higher position, or he sees himself in a higher position. He can't receive it. So maybe we come to the same level now. We are, we are equal. Is it working? Why is it it working? Because at the same level you can't pour. So something has to change. Maybe he's more educated than me. Maybe he has gone to more countries than me. Maybe he has a... <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps. For the sake of the illustration. Paradventure. Paradventure. But there's something that has to shift in this equation. Something what needs to shift? Something has to shift for what was given to me for him to be transpired. Something has to shift. And as long as it doesn't shift, he will not receive. Yeah. He will not receive. 
You know, some of you, let me tell you, your pastor might be single, but they are God's anointed servant to bless your marriage. <laughs> the biggest church in the world, the Catholic Church, all the pastors are single. <laughs> And they still have more marriages and have done more marriages than you. So why are you despising single people? Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, they even confess their marriage. A single man, you come and tell him how you treated your wife. And then he says, I forgive you, my son. And they say, thank you, father. So who are you <laughs> to despise your pastor because they are younger than you or because they are single? Humility. Humility. You know, we were reading today, I think it was today's reading that was talking about Jesus' brothers. I can see you're not up to date with today's reading because nobody said, aha. Uh -huh. Are you? <laughs> it's in the book of John. And the, the brothers tell him, ah, since you are a guy who's doing all these miracles, you go and do them in Jerusalem. Nobody does such things in the hometown. If you want recognition, go. And the Bible says they told this to him because they did not believe in him. His own brothers did not believe in him. They were like, we were born in the same house. Your father is my father. <laughs> huh? I even saw you being beaten by the father. So who are you now to come and tell me that I'm receiving from you? Who are you? The Bible tells us, by the way, that they were so, in fact, they thought he was going mad. Maybe because now he was revealing himself as the son of man. And the Bible tells us they thought he was going crazy. They actually planned a family intervention. They had a sit down. You know these family meetings? Agenda one, our brother. You guys, have you talked to your brother? This is a mother talk. Have you guys talked to your brother? Why haven't we done something about this? And they decided, let's go, we grab him. By the way, this is all in scripture. This is not my imagination. It's actually written. They decide, let's go and take hold of him before he harms himself. And so the Bible tells us they went and found him teaching in a house where he was so surrounded by people that he had not even had a chance to eat. He says, aha, we even knew. The man is not even eating. This is madness. So they send somebody. Your mother and your brothers are waiting for you outside. <laughs> As in, this same guy, they didn't believe in him. They thought he's one of us. I mean, they thought, and, and by the way, Jesus told them, who is my mother and brother? It's not. <laughs> okay, like Jesus wasn't that nice guy, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> I think you, the, the Jesus you read in the Bible does not exist. He said, who is my mother and brother? It's not, it's not you. The people who receive the word of God, these are my mother and brothers right here. That's what he told them. But I want to tell you something shifted. When the anointing came, something shifted. Because later on, you're going to read something in scripture that will shock you. There are two books that are written by Jesus' brother. These same ones. These same ones who are going to arrest him and to, and, to, and to take hold of him. Two of his brothers. You know who his brothers were? James and Jude. James and Jude. Those are, those are his brothers. Those are Jesus' brothers. They were born from the same mother. My bros. James chapter 1, verse 1. James chapter 1, verse 1. Just give us the introduction. He says, let's read it together. James, a servant of God and of my brother, of my bro. What does he say? And of the Lord Jesus Christ. A servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Jesus' brother. Something shifted. Jude. Let's go to Jude chapter 1. First verse of Jude. Jude, let's read again. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of... <laughs> He's not even putting himself on the same level to say that we are bros with Jesus. He's like, ah, uh -uh, that is our Lord. James is the bro here. Yeah. This is the level I'm playing at. We're not playing at the same level. Because that's our Lord. That's our leader. Yeah. There's a humility that happens in this family. Because wow. people, it's interesting. You're going to have to shift your mind to receive anointing. It's not a human thing because your mind is proud. Naturally, my mind is proud. Your mind is proud. 
for us to begin to say, this is a father for me to receive. This is my prophet. You know, there are probably some of you had somebody call me the prophet of the house and wondered, hey, Pastor M has received new titles. When did he become prophet? Does he now want us to wash? He wants us to wash streets. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? What names are, what, what titles is he giving himself now? Yeah. <laughs> as long as our cups are at the same level, I can't pour anything into yours. Yeah, I can't. It's just the way it is. This is just a truth that God is teaching us. Hey, listen guys. You have to be willing. You have to be willing to be humble. To humble yourself. Number three, openness. Openness. You know, people often get stuck with what they learned when they were children. We get stuck with, this is how things have always been. Things are not supposed to change. You know, it's interesting because what we learned as a child becomes what defines our lives from that point. In fact, in this country, people even ban books after high school to indicate that what I've learned is enough. The world should not change after this. There's nothing new to learn. Uh, it's academic bonfire. And they bring all their books and burn them. To symbolize, we have now learned enough. We can now do this thing by ourselves. And there's a sense where people just feel, you know what, I know how to do this. By the way, behind almost every broken marriage, there's someone who knows. Yeah. Someone who knows. They don't want to be taught. It's like, I don't need to learn. Yeah, I know. I know how this man should behave towards me. I know how to be a good husband. Yeah, yeah, they know. Let me tell you, no, knowing will kill you. Yeah. Knowing will kill you. The thing that will save your life is not knowing. And knowing that you don't know. Yeah. Being open to change. Being willing to see things differently. You know, there are people in Jesus' hometown that missed anointing because they were not willing to change. They couldn't change how they saw him. The Bible tells us that they saw him and they said, but this boy were in school with him. Yeah, this guy, in fact, we even know who he dated in high school. Who is he to come and tell us that he is the one written about in the book of Isaiah? He tells us in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? <laughs> it's like we know her. The one who sells vegetables over there. We know her. We know her stall. We've been buying Rolex. What? what? <laughs> Smocha. The Smocha stall down the road. We know her. Who is she? To, who is he to come and tell us now something we don't know? You know, who, what makes him think he's so special? You need to be open for new wisdom and new revelation. You know, it's very interesting because there are people who claim that they want the anointing, but they're not willing to adjust their lives. They're not willing to be open. They're not willing to admit they don't know. I remember having a conversation with somebody once here, not too long ago, and they were explaining to me why they were unhappy with some of the things I've taught. And they said, listen, see, I hear you talk about Bishop Doug, quote Apostle Moses. You're, you're quoting all these people. Don't you know you also know something? Yeah, that's what they said. I've always liked you because you knew something. Now you're coming across as someone who is copying other people. Don't you know that you already have enough? You don't have to try to be someone else. And by the way, it actually sounded very logical the way they put it. In fact, I said, I understand because even me, I used to be like you. <laughs> that's how I thought. I used to think and process like you. Like I know that I know. You know what changed? I began to know that I don't know. Yeah. If I knew, I would be making disciples across the whole world. If I knew, I would have 6,000 churches. Yeah. In every cap capital city of the world by now. If I knew. So clearly, I don't know. And when I find people who know, I go and see. What is it that they're doing different? How come they're getting these results and I'm not getting? Is it that they're praying more than me? Is it that they have a direct route to heaven that I don't know? I want to find out. So this August, I'm going to be right in Ghana. Bishop Doug's conference, I was there last year. 
This year I'm going to take my people, these people with me. In fact, we're even going with Pastor Bonnie and a team from their church as well. Yeah. Because we don't know. <laughs> In fact, we sh that, that should be the name of the group. We don't know. We are here because we don't know. Yeah. In fact, if we knew, they should be the ones who are here. <laughs> yeah. But we don't know. So we go and we learn. And because we, we don't know, one day we will know. You see, if you, if, if you don't know that you don't know, you will never know. It's only when you admit you don't know that you're ready to learn and then you will know. And a time will come when people will come from across the world to receive from you. So there has to be an openness. Be open to change. Oh, Mavuno used to be like this. Oh, I liked the old Mavuno. Oh, I liked it when Mavuno used to be such a cool church. When Mavuno was Mavuno. <laughs> Even me, I liked it. Just the same way I liked nursery school. But I can't stay there my whole life. <laughs> it's true. You can't be stuck in nursery school your whole life. There's a place to grow up. Okay, the, the people at the back don't like what I'm saying. I think these people over here, they seem to have a problem with what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> the Bible says, by now you ought to be teachers. Yeah, but you're still drinking milk. You're still in kindergarten as a Christian. Jesus was serious when he said, make disciples of all nations. And that is your mission as a Christian. If you're not doing, you're not making disciples of all nations right now, you don't know. You need to be in a place where you're saying, teach me how to do this. Yeah. Teach me to obey. Teach me how to obey God's command. This is why we have to always be posturing to learn. And by the way, let me just tell you this. The people who know they don't know end up making the most amazing leaders. Yeah. I mean, I've loved... One thing I love about listening to Bishop Doug, he always talks about who he's learning from. I mean, I see a man who is so far ahead, but he's humble enough to keep referring and saying, this is what this person did. The other day, I was listening to him talking about Bishop Oyedepo of Winners Chapel and what he learned from him. And I'm thinking, wow, okay. You're still learning. Yeah. I love that. By the way, when we went to Nigeria, that's the experience we had, isn't it? Because we met pastors. I remember meeting a pastor who has a church of 100,000 sita. Can you visualize in your mind 100,000 sita? You can't. I'm trying to tell you, you can't. Because even me, I couldn't. Until I saw it. No pillars, by the way. 100,000 in one massive building. It takes you a long time to walk from here to the other side. Yeah. And he has two services. <laughs> uh, he has two services. And they have overflows. And I still remember just listening to this man and how he talked about how he had just come from Bishop Oyedepo's conference. And he had gone not to speak, but to be there to learn. Even me, I don't know, honestly. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, do you know? Me, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I need to be open. For me to receive this anointing, I know I don't know. Too many Christians know, and they know too much. Like the people in Jesus' hometown. The, fo the fourth one. Am I preaching good? All right. Sit for a minute so I can finish this. All right. Number four. Number four. This one, I mentioned it before. In one of my other talks, I will mention it again. And the reason I mention it in two talks is because it's so, so important. <laughs> Honor. Wow. Honor. That's a cost you have to be willing to pay. Honor. You know, it's interesting because we've been learning. This last week, we were learning about the Shunammite woman. By the way, how many people have enjoyed the series this month? It's been such a good series. And this Shunammite woman, she's rich, she's, she's got it all going, but she sees the man of God in the town and she says, this guy is always passing here. Passy, come and eat food in my house. And she's like, this guy, he needs to eat. Anytime he's in town, he'll be eating in my house. Then she gets to a place, she realizes, uh -uh, not for this anointing. She talks to her husband and says, let's build a, a house for the man of God. Let's make a room for him and furnish it so that whenever he's in town, this will be his base of operation. He, she builds for her pastor a house. Yeah. She understands the spiritual principle of honor. Wow. 
And guess what happens to her? Anointing overflow. The thing she thought she had, she thought she had everything, she didn't have a child. And that overflows in her life. Let me tell you something, guys. Honor unlocks. Honor unlocks. Honor unlocks. I said it before, honor unlocks. It turns on that current. It is such a powerful thing. I, I want to teach my church this. Because it's, a, it's going to be such, such a powerful revelation in your life. Honor doesn't diminish you. Honor propels you. Yeah. When it comes to anointing, honor. You never receive honor if you don't. Uh, anointing if you don't know how to honor. You know, it's very interesting because Jesus was honored everywhere. And miracles happened everywhere. Miracles everywhere. <laughs> Until he went home. That's the one place nobody honored him. Yeah. They were, in fact, the Bible says they took offense at him. When you're offended, you can't honor, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Son of Mary. <laughs> Who is this son of Mary? Yeah, that's what they called him. And that, the theologians tell us the reason they said son of Mary is because his dad had probably died some time back. And they're like, who is this son of Mary? You know, it's almost a disparaging way. He doesn't even have a father. What is he telling us? Yeah. They took offense. Let me tell you people, you can never receive anointing from somebody you're offended by. Yeah. You can't. If your pastor's offended you, my friend, we need to resolve that issue. Because you cannot receive the blessing God has for you in that church. Ah, my goodness. I, I'm saying this, you know, sometimes the, the problem is when I'm preaching, I'm always, think, I'm always seeing faces. I'm always seeing people. I'm always seeing situations where I know the, the answer to this is what I'm saying right now. Yeah, there's somebody here. That's your answer. The, and the thing that is locking you back is your dishonor. Your lack of honor. You need to honor let, let, let honor never lack. Honor never lack in this movement. Pastor Kilonzi, I love the fact that you're such an honoring leader. You know, Pastor Kilonzi is a, is, a, is a product of other pastors. Yeah. His church was planted by Pastor Kama. Yeah. A few weeks ago, he was visiting Pastor Kama in America. Pastor Kama passed on that church to Pastor Kevin Derito. The next week he was visiting Pastor Kevin Derito. And I'm sure those people in downtown, you've heard him mention their names over and over. Yeah. Yeah. He honors. He understands he didn't make himself. So he honors. You know, it's, it's very easy for him to come to downtown and take over the church and act like nobody ever gave him that church. People died. People gave their lives for him to receive it. And he recognizes that. Some of you, you receive ministry, you are appointed to a position and you immediately act like the person who was there before you never existed. You dishonor them. Like, why are they coming into my space? Why are they interfering? Why can't they let me lead? Uh -uh. Tell your neighbor, that's not your portion. Yeah. Don't let dishonor cut short your ministry. That ministry is anointed, but it's an, it, there's a flowing anointing you received as you received that position. Uh -uh. You must honor the person you received it from. Even if they are not ready to receive your honor, give it anyway. Give it anyway. Remember you came from somewhere. This is why we tell you to honor your parents. Whether they are, whether they are, whether they are ready to receive it or not, you, you honor your parents. Always. This is something that needs to become, if you're in Mavuno Church, one of the things that should always distinguish you is your parents are glad to be your parents. Yeah, because of how you honor them consistently. Honor is how we transmit this anointing. And then the last one, the last one is listening. Listening. Hey, listening is powerful, let me tell you. L listening, I think I even mentioned it earlier. It's one of the best ways for you to understand because the word, as Jesus says, my word is spirit and it's life. The word I give to you is spirit. John 6, 33. The words I've spoken to you are, the, are spirit and life. Other versions say they are full of spirit and life. You know, as you listen to God's message shared by your prophet, those words are not just words. They become spirit and life. This thing of listening, you'll hear me emphasize it over and over. I know it's not, it's not been our culture in the past, but I believe that is changing now. Amen. We're beginning to understand the power and the value of listening. Let me, let me introduce 
maybe this one is important enough. I'm going to give a story to tell you why this is so important. There's a, a passage in the scripture where a king had been attacked. His name was Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was attacked by a massive army, many times larger than the army of, of, of Judah. And it looked like everything was going to be demolished. And he was so scared, he called a prayer meeting. And he told people, let's call on God. And these people called on God. And in the middle of the calling on God and praying, the army is coming. All they can do is pray because they have no plan. They're going to be finished. And Jehoshaphat, he prayed and then as he prayed and he finished his prayer, God put the word in a prophet called Jehaziel. And Jehaziel said, march out tomorrow because the Lord has given you this battle. The battle is not yours, it belongs to God. And so the next morning they wake up, they've received a message. A message that most people would be like, what do you mean? That army is still bigger than ours. They are still better equipped than ours. But this man now stands up with his people and they walk out. And he puts the, the, the choir in front and they go out to fight this battle. And at that point, he says something really interesting. 2 Corinthians 2.20 it says, early in the morning they left for the desert of Tekoa. It says, as they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah, and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophet and you will be successful. That's a very powerful thing for him to say. Most Christians would have stopped at have faith in the Lord your God. Isn't it? Because, I mean, as Christians, we know all we need is God. I just need to have faith in God and I'm, I'm fine. I'll win the battle. But he says, no, 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 no. Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be established. And then he says, have faith in his prophets and you will prosper. And you know, they did a very radical thing. They walked forth, forward. They went singing. And guess what happened? They didn't even reach. The Lord set up um, ambushes. So the enemy started looking at each other and seeing enemy. They have, they have come as one army all this time until they reach there. Then they look and they see, Allah, you're one of them. The next thing you know, they are killing each other. And by the time the Israelites reached there, they were receiving plunder. They came to collect plunder. He says for three days, they were just collecting plunder. These people have left so much wealth behind. They came to destroy you. They left you richer than you are. Yeah, that's what happened to these people. But I want to see three things I want you to see. I'm, I'm still illustrating this point of listening. Number one, anointing requires faith in God's prophets. Anointing requires faith in God's prophets. You see, he made this distinction about having faith in God and having faith in the prophet. And for many Christians, you'll be like, what is that? How, like, isn't faith in God enough? You know, it's very interesting because the King James Version, the New King James Version says, believe in the Lord your God and you'll be established. Believe in his prophets and you shall prosper. The word established is a Hebrew word, a man, A-M-A-N, like a dude, a man. Yeah, it's just a, one word. And what this word means is to nurture, to foster, to build up, to nurse, to strengthen. That's what that word means. And then the second word, when you believe in the prophets, you prosper. The word for prosper is shalak. Tell your neighbor shalak. Shalak means to propel forward, to push forward, to break out, to advance. So you've got two different concepts here. The first one has to do with being established, being planted, being rooted. That's the first word. When you believe in God, that's what happens. The second one has to do with speed, advance, propel. They almost seem like two opposite forces, isn't it? It's interesting because the best illustration for how this passage works was given to me by Apostle Mukisa, Moses Mukisa of Worship, uh, of, of worship Harvest. He's, he's a Formula One fan. Any Formula One fans in the house? Okay, they're around, they're there. So he said something very interesting and I, I began to understand this passage in a whole new way. He said there are two opposite forces that operate on a Formula One car. Have you ever seen a Formula One car? It looks like this. You've seen them on TV, yeah? So there are two opposite forces that operate when that car is moving. The first one is the down force. Because of the way it's shaped, 
the wind hits it and pushes it down. The down force is so strong, it's about 4,200 kilom- kilograms. It's like four tons just of wind sits on that car. It's like grounding it, keeping it down. The funny thing is, the Formula One car is only 800 kilos. So it's, that's about five times its weight. So the car is moving, but five times of its weight is sitting on it. Now, why is that important? This thing is moving so fast, it can't turn a corner. The downforce is what makes it so stable. It's able to take that corner. You see how they move? Vroom, vroom. They can do that because of that downforce. They're moving so fast, they need something to stabilize them. That's the downforce. But the opposite force is the engine torque. The engine has a very powerful force that pushes the thing forward. And this thing can go, in fact, the fastest recorded one was about 372 kilometers per hour. I mean, 372 kilometers, let me tell you something. I have had the opportunity of driving at 180 kilometers per hour. Don't ask me where. (laughs) Okay, it was in Germany. It wasn't in Kenya. (laughs) Let me tell you, when you drive at 180 kilometers per hour, you are praying. Even if you're an atheist. It's so fast, you're just seeing things go... You don't even see what you don't even know what they are. This thing moves at 372 kilometers per hour. So you've got these two opposite forces. One brings establishment, one brings forward movement. You believe in God, you are established. You are strengthened. You believe in the prophets, you are propelled forward. You move forward towards where you're supposed to be going. And Jehoshaphat is saying, you need both forces. Some Christians have believed God only. And that's why they are established to stagnation. As in you've been a Christian for 20 years. You know the Bible back and forth, even in Hebrew. But there's no fruit in your life. Nothing. Only Hebrew. (laughs) And you know, when we go to heaven, we'll know all languages. So all of a sudden, even the baby Christians will have the same as you. Yeah. There has to be more. And what Jehoshaphat is saying, when you believe in the prophets, this is the king himself saying it. We believe in God, but we believe in the prophet. And when we believe in God's prophet, we are propelled. We are pushed forward. We achieve the thing God wants us to do. Somebody say amen. amen. Anointing requires faith in the prophet. Tell, tell your neighbor that. Anointing requires faith in the prophet. Yeah. I know I'm talking to people who've been Christians for a long time and maybe you've never had anything like this. Because all you've been told is it's just Jesus and Jesus is enough. And let me tell you, Jesus is enough. You don't need anything else for salvation. You don't need anything else to go to heaven. Jesus is enough. But Jesus has chosen to pour anointing and blessing and power for your assignment through human beings. And for you to receive that power, You need to have faith in God's prophet. Number two, anointing requires receiving God's prophets. Somebody say receiving. Receiving Receiving God's prophets. You know what this man did? He knew he was a king. He knew he had all power to command the army. But in this case, he realized this prophet is actually God's representative. This word he has given is my command. Imagine you're the king. You're the one that was supposed to be commanding. But he's like, I have received this man as God's messenger to me. And because of that, I will not do what I think. I will do what he has told me to do. A very humbling thing. He humbles himself to receive from this prophet. When you believe in God and believe in the prophets, the two go together. If you believe in a man of God without believing in God, you're in trouble. You will go very fast to hell. Yeah, you'll be in error. Because you will receive the man of God with all his issues. Every man of God, there's no man or woman of God who is perfect. None of them comes anywhere close to Jesus. They have their issues. Can I tell you a secret? Pastor M has got some mega issues. (laughs) I have serious issues that I would would not want. You know the things you see in your children, you're like, now where did they get that from? And you're like, oh gosh, I think I'm like that. (laughs) those of you who are parents know exactly what I'm talking about kids do, they copy things they're not supposed to copy yeah, they do such funny things like I, I think I've told this story before how we saw a child 
one of them whom I shall not name when they were like three years old and they were walking like this <laughs> three years old and we're looking at her in fascination like how like where where the three year old like we laughed we're like how did they then the next day I saw my wife walking <laughs> I'd never noticed that about her she just had like a serious face. I mean, like a face of get out of my way, you know. And the three-year-old picked it up. It's like, that's how people are meant to walk. Aha. Uh-huh. And they did it. Your children will pick up all straight things from you. Let me just tell you, there are things I don't want you to pick up from me. There are actually things when I go in prayer, I pray, Lord, may this weakness of mine never become a weakness of Mavuno. Wow. Lord, Lord forbid it that this would ever be passed on to Inoni Mavuno. Because I'm just a man. You cannot believe in a man if you don't believe in the man's God. God is always first. He will keep you from error. Because when the man starts telling you something that's not from God, you will recognize the voice of your father. So you need to believe in God. But if you believe in God and not believe in the man or the woman God has sent to speak into your life, then you will miss out. You will miss out on God's blessing. Because you don't have your socket to plug in. You don't have it. And so you're going to be there very happily coming to church the rest of your life without fruitfulness. Let me tell you this. You don't want to become a mediocre Christian. You don't want to become less than your father. Uh -uh. If you become less than me, you're failed. Yeah. If you do less things than Pastor Karo and I, you're failed. Because a good father... His, he wants his children to do greater things than him. Yeah. And because Pastor Faith is my daughter, that means she has to do greater things than us, which means her daughters have to do greater things than her and her sons. Greatness has to increase in every generation in this ministry. Yeah. Otherwise, we've failed. Yeah. But the only way that will happen, yeah, that's a great verse, because the light of the righteous shines brighter and brighter. Yeah. It's, it's, it's glory after glory. Yeah. So, so for the only way that is going to happen is if you begin to understand who has been given the word to speak into your life and receive that person. Otherwise, you're going to remain a safe Christian until you die. And that's not God's will for you. Tell your neighbor, that's not God's will for you. Anointing requires obeying God's prophets. Anointing requires obeying God's prophets. It requires that. You know, it's interesting because Jehoshaphat went radical in obedience. He's like, we've been told that the battle belongs to the Lord. Aha. Uh-huh. God is serious. Sour. Worshipped him. Come. <laughs> Most armies put their ninjas in front. The guys who are the serious warriors. The seal team, you know, to go and cause ambushes against the enemy. He's like, see, we've been told God is in charge. So the worshippers of God have to be in front. So that God can be in charge. <laughs> That's suicidal obedience. <laughs> He's like, so you've said I do it. Sour. Let me show you how I'm going to do it. Worship him. Come. And the worship him. I'm like, huh? Us. Yes. We have been told. Stand in front. You want to kill us? No. God is, the battle is the Lord. Can you guys don't believe? Stand in front there. <laughs> Let's do this thing. And that's what they do. Radical. I mean, if this thing went badly, Jehoshaphat would be known as the most foolish king in the universe. People would still be talking about a foolish king who went with worship leaders in front and they were all slaughtered. Yeah. But he understands God has said it, that means I will do it. Yeah. If God has said it, I will do it. And remember, God didn't speak to Jehoshaphat, it's the prophet who spoke to him. Yeah. God used the prophet, but he said this is God's word and he obeyed it. You know, scripture has many examples of people who chose to obey God's prophets. There's a widow who decided to give Elijah her last cake. I mean, guys, think about some of these things. You know, I always tell you, read the Bible with imagination. Don't just read it. You're a widow. It's you and your child, your boy. It's the two of you and one cake. And after that, you die. And you're a mother who gave birth. And then the prophet comes and says, give me the cake. Me, I'm hungry. (laughs) Uh, Is this is this, a, this is a man of God. It's personal, isn't it? Yeah. That's what she does. She decides God has spoken. This is his prophet. Have the cake. 
And the Bible tells us her food did not run out through the whole drought. Yeah. She obeyed radically. There's an army general who decided to obey when Elijah told him to go and plunge himself in a dirty river. Yeah, he could have decided. In fact, at first he was so annoyed. Kwani, there are no good rivers in my country. I'm being told to go and... Yeah. But somebody came and told him, ah, ah, dude, listen to this one. He's a prophet. And he obeyed. And he was healed of his leprosy. Obedience. There's a guy, there's some servants. I always find these ones of the servants very interesting. Jesus is told, Turn, there's no wine. And then he says, aha, uh-huh, what do you have? Water. Jugs. Go and fill these jugs with water. Now you need to understand, those are not, it tells us they were large ceremonial jars. Each of those jars carried over 136 liters. So we're talking about 800 liters to 1,000 liters in total. There were no taps. There were no pipes. This was a matter of trips to the river or to the well. It was not the rainy season of El Nino. <laughs> and then Jesus says, "Aha! Uh-huh, I know there's a crisis. Everyone is running around. Fill those things with water. Those people had a chance to say, uh, dude, you don't understand. We're going to lose our jobs at this point. We, we need advice that makes sense. But their mother, Jesus' mother says what? Do what he tells you. Yeah. Listen, somebody, I believe today God is saying to you, do what he told you. Yeah. Do what that prophecy told you. Do it. Stop, try, stop treating words of prophecy with contempt. Do what he told you. And so they feel in this thing. They take a long time. They feel it. And then they taste it. And they say, my goodness, this is the best wine. Everybody serves the best wine faster. When people are too drunk, they bring the other bad wine. But you have saved the best for the last. It was an obedience of God's prophet. It didn't make sense. And let me tell you, many times the instruction may not make sense. But they obeyed it anyway. And then the final thing I want to say, final thing. Tell your neighbor, final thing. Don't despise subtle anointings. Don't despise subtle anointings. People who are carnal, people who are not walking in the spirit, they measure a person by their charisma, by how loud their voice is, by how dramatically they shout. Yeah, that's how people who are carnal think. But interesting, the thing about Prophet Jahaziel, the one who gave this prophecy, that's the only time you ever hear about him in scripture. He's not even one of the famous prophets. He just stood up, prophesied, said it, and then went into obscurity. (laughs) I mean, Jehaziel could have said, surely, if it was Elisha at least, there are some miracles we know. You what have you done? Yeah, this was a subtle prophet. He was not a loud prophet. He was not a demonstrative prophet. He just stood up and said, listen guys, I hear the Lord saying. (laughs) And he said it. You know, it's very easy to despise subtle anointings. Maybe your pastor has a subtle anointing. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Let me tell you about people with subtle anointings. Elisha had a subtle anointing. How do I know? You know, Elisha was different. Elijah was a real prophet. He wore those crazy clothes. He had dreadlocks. I mean, he looked like a prophet. You saw him, you're scared of him. Elisha was a bald-headed short man. In fact, when he got the anointing, some boys started insulting him. (laughs) Hey, Baldy, what's up? (laughs) They completely dishonored him. But he was like, seriously? I'm not impressed with this guy. 2 Kings 5, 11, it says, But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. 
Like, he was like, a real prophet banner. Anointing. Huh? Um, touch. <laughs> Power. That's what he was expecting. Elisha didn't even come out. He sent his servant to tell him, by the way, just go tell him to take a shower in, in Jordan River. <laughs> go to Nairobi River and take a bath. You look at Pastor James. I mean, seriously, that's a serious pastor. I mean, just, just look at him. I mean, these are the kind of pastors we have in this church. So easy. So easy. Yeah. But you know the danger of that? It's very easy to despise the subtle anointing. It's easy to say, ah, if Apostle so and so from Nigeria, wherever Ogu State comes and tells me, I will do. Yeah. But this one, <laughs> this one isn't he from my hometown? Don't I know his brothers? Yeah, we've been together all this time. <laughs> yeah, in fact, he lives in Zambezi just over there. We are together. Huh? Jesus said a radical thing to his disciples. Matthew 10. I'm going to end with this. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever is, welcomes a righteous man as a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. You know, let me just tell you this. There are people who, and I've seen over the years, there are people who receive me as a cool guy. Yeah, and I'm a cool guy, by the way. <laughs> I can be the cool guy. There are people who receive me as an inspiring pastor who preaches good messages. And they receive, they receive the reward of an inspiring pastor. They receive their messages. Yeah. There are people who see me as a classmate. Yeah. And they receive a, they have a good body of a classmate. And it's a beautiful thing. I have no problem. It's their reward, isn't it? There are people who receive me as a relative. And that's okay. By the way, I don't mind. I mean, it's what they receive the reward of having. I'm a very good relative to have, by the way. Bobo is, a, is becoming my relative. I'm a good relative, by the way. Serious relative. Her, her brother is marrying my daughter. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's one who can even receive me as a husband. And let me tell you, there's some serious husband results there. There's some rewards. There's some rewards. But there are people who receive me as a prophet. And they've received a prophet's reward. And it's something I've come to understand that it's actually a beautiful thing because you receive what you're expecting. Pastor Gordon, just come quick, quick, quick. I, I need you to share a testimony here. You said this in passing recently about something that happened to you and your disciple. Remember, that, you know the story I want? Yeah. All right. Um, so I think it was a few years ago, maybe two. Um, <clears throat> there's one of our disciples that uh, was struggling to conceive. And so we decided with my wife to, to take them for their anniversary to Isaac House, which is Pastor M and Pastor Caro's guest house. So we went there, and of course, the mood in Isaac House is, was mooding. So, <laughs> so, so we actually, we, we were just going to hang out, but the agenda was clear. And, <laughs> and, so, and so, long story short, uh, they now have a son that was conceived there. Yeah. yeah. I think what I like is how you pray for them. Yes, yes, we, <clears throat> we prayed for them prophetically and we said uh, God is going to bless them and they are going to have a child, especially because Isaac House is a miracle story. Uh, if you've not visited Isaac House, this is, this is not part of the story, Pastor M. It's not an endorsement, but if you've not visited Isaac House, there's a beautiful story there and we rode on that platform even as we were praying for them and now they have a two-year-old. Yeah. I love that. I think what... I think the way you put it before, and not to put words in your mouth, I think what you said to me is you said, because you're in your prophet's house, mm. I speak to you with the same anointing. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I seem to remember you. Yes, yeah. yeah. Mm. I love that. Right. There's a story, um, I don't think Henry is around, huh? Okay, you come. You come, you represent your disciple. Everyone's dis- representing disciples today. So you represent Pastor Henry Olero, who <laughs> might be watching us. He's a proud father of a beautiful baby girl. I almost call him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So tell us, tell us a bit about his story. Wow. Um, Pastor Henry uh, leads our Kizazi Church, Mabuno Kizazi. You're a good man. Um, he's married to one Carol Olero. And um, over a period of time, they had several miscarriages, I think about three or four. Uh, and it was a very discouraging space. So in the gathering last year, uh, eh, Kampala, you guys remember? Eh? Um, uh, Pastor M and Pastor Carol called people to come for prayer, and they came. In fact, it's so interesting. By the time both of them left there, they knew their prayer has been answered. Wow. So, the day before yesterday, uh, what a word given. Oh, the word given <coughs> by Pastor Iman and Pastor Carol is if guys go uh, and do what people do. <laughs> you understanding? We are understanding. We are understanding. The anointing is there will be babies in 2024. Are we together? There will be babies in 2024. When Pastor Iman and Pastor Karo came later for the Mashariki Network gathering, they went back to them to tell them they have conceived. Two days ago, they got like the most beautiful baby girl. Wow. Wow. How long have they been without children? Have they been trying? Um, the gap between their firstborn and this child is like seven years. Yes. Thank you. Wow. Amen. To God be the glory. Yeah. yeah. Um. Oh, Pardon. Mm-hmm. And the nickname of the child is Apodidomai. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know what that means, just watch the watch the last gathering. <laughs> wow. Come on. You know, it's sometimes it's uncomfortable sharing stories, huh? But I think I want you to see. Because there are many people in Mavuno who have received an understanding that is shifting their lives. The reason the team went with Papa Kilo to Kampala is because they understood this is our prophet. There's something in him that we need in our lives. By the way, it's not him. But there's something God has put in him that is for me. You know, as I'm looking at you, Pastor, saying, uh, this one, her and her husband who's at the back, you know? Yeah. That one there shouting. <laughs> My wife can tell you. When we first met this couple, because we met them before they got married, they had everything going against them. Everything. She'll tell you. He will tell you. Their marriage was dead before it's, it was dead. You know, you could see it and you're like, they're incompatible. They have issues. Their family has issues. They have so many things working against them that you don't even know what to say. But I remember that at that point, because Pastor actually came from Uganda, she was like, um, it was almost like one of these online relationships. Because they dated online and then now got married and came. And it was just a, it was just a thing. You know, it was, you look at it and you're thinking, my gosh. But I remember that Pastor came and with Emmanuel and said, we're your children. And there's a blessing in your home. And they started to hang out with us. You know today, how many years have you been married? Three. Let me tell you, these guys, when I see them today, I see nothing but transferred anointing. Yeah. I see nothing but transferred anointing. We have a marriage that would not have survived. 
And I can tell you, everything was saying this marriage will not survive. But I believe it's an impartation that they've received from Pastor Caro and I that has completely propelled them beyond many three-year couples. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I know I haven't even asked her, but I can, I can share that boldly because I know. You know, because it's there. And I can tell you when I look at my pastors, I can tell you where they have received impartation from me. Yeah, I can tell you. Papa Kilo and Mama Kilo, you have a great marriage. Kuna impartation, kuna vile impartation na kuja kwenyo. There are things that have happened, like, and I can tell you, I know. And your marriage is even going to get better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you won't even be taken, you won't even be taken to Cape Town. Wa utapelekwa Cape Town, pale utapelekwa. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you not wait for 30 years to go to Cape Town like for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, it's it's just impartation by the way. And I'm saying this because I know there are sons and daughters of Pastor James who've received the impartation. And I see them and I'm like, "Ay, who is Chris Toys? Pastor Chris Toys. Yeah. That loud man there. <laughs> yeah. This this man here. I met him the first time I met him, he was this student from Daystar, completely confused about if and where he was going. <laughs> Chris, how long ago? That was like how many years ago? Was it two or three? Three years ago. Yeah. And I told him, come, come and serve this man. Yeah. Today, he's a campus pastor of Mavuno Titale. Yeah. And he's not just a campus pastor, by the way. He's a wise man full of the Holy Spirit. Ask the people in Kitale and they'll tell you that. Yeah. It's called impartation, by the way. There's a transfer that has happened through his pastor to him that has propelled him beyond many young people his generation. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And let me tell you, there are many people around Pastor James, but not many of them, not all of them have been propelled at the same speed. There's a posture of the heart that just opens this guy to move quickly, to be propelled, to prosper, to believe in God's prophet and to move fast. There's something. And you know, you can stay there offended, thinking, what is this Pastor James telling me? He's even younger than me. Yeah, and you stay established. <laughs> Don't get annoyed, get anointed. <laughs> yeah, stop being offended. <laughs> yeah. Move fast. Move fast. God wants us to move fast. Thanks, Pastor Chris. You're a great man. Yeah. I love God for him. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, I, I think what I'm trying to do, and I know there are many stories, there are many testimonies of people who've just propelled because of choosing to align to the blessing of the house. Yeah. I can see it. Pastor Madrid, you and Pastor James, you have moved fast. They have moved so fast. There are Mavunais who have been in Mavuno for years who are not doing the things these guys are doing. Yeah. But there's a way they just came to Papa Godi and Mama Noel and just said, we are following you. And as they followed, shoo, yeah, 372 kilometers per hour. Shalak! Somebody say shalak! Yeah. They're shalaking. They shall not lack. They're shalaking. Yeah. Yeah. It's a truth. It's a truth. So guys, I think what I'm trying to say is there is, it, and by the way, this is a humbling message, isn't it? Because I'm hoping as I'm talking, maybe there are places you're seeing and you're realizing, Lord, I can see where I didn't follow. I can see where I didn't uh, align. The, the Lord never brought his word to condemn. He brings it to save. He brings it to bless. I don't think it's too late. If you're in a place where you've not honored, you're in a place where you've not aligned yourself to receive impartation, it's not too late. I believe that's why you're here in this gathering. To begin to understand who you are called to be. In fact, what I want you to even think about is, who is your DG leader? Who is that person who God has put already in your life? How do you begin to align yourself to that person? Do they even know? Yeah, I remember in Fearless, I think it was last year, the year before, and I asked, who is your disciple? Do they know? And who is your disciple? And do they know? Have you gone to your DG leader and said, by the way, yeah, you're younger than me, but you're my disciple. You're the one God is going to use to bless me in this season. And I want you to know that I know. And I'm following. Yeah. This is where humility now starts being displayed. Wow. I want to encourage you, even today, do that. If they're not here, send them a text. Just say, by the way, you're the person I honor that God has put in my life to lead me. This is not about human beings. 
It's just about aligning ourselves to God's blessing through the poor he's put in our life. This is how it operates. Guys, there's a word for the, of, of God in this house. I'm, I, uh, Pastor Godwin made a joke about people who, when I said get out of debt, just never took it seriously. But let me tell you guys, I didn't say that casually. The Lord has revealed to me that there's going to be a great economic reset. Yeah. There will be a serious reset in the years to come. And I don't know how soon. What I'm trying to do is prepare God's people for the future. Because I believe a time is coming when the global economy will not work. And we will need a kingdom economy among ourselves. So when you hear me and do, we didn't record this. We should have recorded like how many people got out of debt that year. And how many people have gotten out of debt since then. Because I believe there's an instruction God gave us. And there are many testimonies of people who aligned, even though they didn't have the resources, and God just shellacked them. He made them move fast. When you hear an instruction, take it as an instruction for God's word. Just say, God is telling us as a church. And because of that, we are aligning ourselves as a business family to achieve this word, to obey the word of the prophet. You know what? If you don't obey, guess what? Me, I'm still shellacking. So nobody will ever force you to obey in this church. Nobody will ever force you and tell you, this, you have to do it this way. No, no. I believe in freedom. I believe that, you know what? This is God's... When, when God convinces you, you will turn around. And maybe when you see all the people in your DG shellacking, you'll finally... You know, some people need to see other people succeeding before they decide to try. So some of you need to see results before you see. That's okay. You're in the right place. Just keep coming and keep listening. But I really believe that there's a season coming of prosperity and of great influence. And this kind of forum is...